We appreciate everybody joining us for our weekly Monday morning coronavirus, COVID-19, Miller Johnson response team uh, weekly roundup. Uh, we try to feature different topics of interest for the community, clients, other constituents, and um, we've got some good topics today, I think, um, lined up. And so we appreciate everybody joining. Hopefully we can share some more new relevant information with folks. Uh, my name is Eric Daly. I'm a um, I'm an attorney in uh, Miller Johnson's business and corporate law group, and I'm joined today by Sandy Andre and Andy Portinga, who will introduce themselves um, during their respective portions of today's presentation. So today we're going to cover a few different um, issues, some of which are really updates to things we've covered in the past, but the first of which is something that we uh, we did some programming on earlier on during the pandemic. And obviously we've been working with clients since then on these types of issues, but we wanted to circle back on this topic um, and, and bring Andy on today to talk about it. And that's kind of recent developments related to COVID-19 insurance coverage issues and litigation, things like business interruption claims, um, et cetera. So that'll be our first topic, and Andy is here to, to talk about that today. I will then uh, provide a, a short update on just some SBA Small Business Administration funding updates, and then Sandy, um, as, as she always does so well, will uh, give us an update on some of the MIOSHA um, issues and latest order developments uh, here in the state of Michigan. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Andy to give us the litigation update and recent developments related to insurance coverage. Thanks, Eric. Good morning, everybody. My name is Andy Portinga. I'm a litigator here at Miller Johnson, and I focus on insurance related litigation and insurance related issues. A little over a year ago, pretty much every business in the state of Michigan and across the country either had to shut down or curtail its operations due to the pandemic and the executive orders. And when that happened, a lot of business owners, particularly small business owners, wondered if there might be insurance coverage for their loss of income. And the natural place to look for that coverage, of course, is the business interruption policy, because pretty much everybody's business was interrupted to some degree. And it raised the question of whether there's insurance coverage for pandemic related shutdowns. And you might think, well, our, my business was interrupted, so therefore there should be coverage under the business interruption policy. But of course, when it comes to insurance, the devil is always in the details. And the business interruption policy is part of the typical property and casualty policy. It covers uh, loss of income related to damage to the property. The key language in those in those policies is what I put on the screen here. Those policies recover loss of income resulting from direct physical loss of or damage to covered property. Now, this language, these this phrase here varies a little bit from insurer to, to insurer, but the basic concept is the same in every business interruption policy. That is, the coverage is limited to direct physical loss or damage to covered property. Additionally, a lot of policies have a virus exclusion in them. The virus exclusion came about in 2006 after the prior uh, COVID, which you may have forgotten about, SARS. There was a SARS outbreak in uh, Canada and in other places. And after that, the industry actually wrote a virus exclusion and started putting them in, into the business interruption policies. So a lot of policies have virus exclusions. Go to the next slide if we could, Eric. And so the question for pandemic related losses is whether the pandemic has caused direct physical loss or damage. That is, has there been physical damage to the property that's covered? Is that damage direct? Does it matter whether the virus is actually found on the property or not? Was it the virus that caused the loss or did the executive orders requiring shutdowns cause the loss? 
these are all issues that have come up uh, in interpreting these um, business interruption policies. So perhaps to no, no one's surprise, you go to the next slide, please, Eric. The industry has taken the position, the insurance industry has taken the position that there is no coverage for uh, these claims. And the industry is uniformly de denying business interruption claims related to the pandemic. And the industry's position is that the virus does not cause any physical damage or loss to the property. That is, their position is that there is no physical change to the property and therefore no coverage. Policyholders, on the other hand, are arguing that if you're denied access to your property, your physical property, because of a shutdown order, that uh, that falls within the coverage for direct physical loss of, um, of the property because you've lost the ability to use the property. So how, how, are these playing, how are these disputes playing out so far? Can we go to the next slide, please? Um, as I said, the, the industry is uniformly denying these claims. And as a result, there's been a flood of litigation nationwide. There's been about 1,500 lawsuits filed across the country against insurers for denying business interruption claims. About five of those lawsuits are situations where the policy does not have a virus exclusion. And these policies are, are these issues are being litigated across the country. Now, how goes the war? Well, I use the, the Star Wars picture here intentionally because uh, this is gonna be an epic battle that will last longer than the Star Wars franchise itself, in my opinion. Um, this is a, a battle that will last for years, if not decades. It's similar to the battle over coverage for asbestos back in the 70s or the battle over coverage for pollution related uh, exposure in the 80s. Um, and so I, I think this is going to be a long running battle between insurers and policyholders. So how's it going so far? Well, it depends on your perspective, but um, uh, so far at least the insurers have the upper hand. So far, um, in cases where a motion has been decided, that is not every case uh, has progressed to this point yet, but in cases where the insurer, uh, the insurance company has brought a motion to dismiss, in about 80% of those cases, the motion to dismiss has been granted. When the policies have a virus exclusion, um, the odds go up for the insurance company. About 90% of those cases have been dismissed. Without the virus exclusion, about 70% of the cases have been dismissed. And we'll discuss why in, in just a moment here. The insurers are doing better in federal court uh, and then in state court. In federal court, over 80% of the cases have been dismissed so far and state court is closer to 50-50. Most of these cases end up in federal court because the amount of controversy usually exceeds $75,000 and the insurance company usually has a different state citizenship than the, the policy, which is how they can get into federal court. So the insurers are doing better in federal court than they are in, in state court. So how are things going in Michigan? Well, Michigan sort of mirrors the the national trend in that so far at least the insurers are doing better than the policyholders in these um, lawsuits. There is one decision in state court out of Ingham County. There, um, Judge uh, Dragonchuk in the Gavrilides management case adopted the insurance company's position that the phrase direct physical loss requires some tangible loss to the covered property and she ruled that the virus did not cause such a, a tangible loss. Um, in federal court, uh, similar results here in the Western District of Michigan, Judge Jarboe in a case involving St. Julian Wine Company adopted the same interpretation of the policy. Um, she determined that the virus does not cause physical loss to covered property and that therefore there's no coverage. On the other side of the state in the Eastern District, um, and in a case involving a dentist, Dr. Kirsch, uh, judge reached the, um, the same conclusion. Uh, if you can go to the next slide, please. There's been several cases involving um, policies that had virus exclusions, and every one of those has been dismissed on, on um, both the Eastern and the Western District of, of Michigan, with one exception. And the last exception is the last uh, bullet point there, in case involving a hair salon 
In that uh, case, the policyholder had actually had an endorsement on its policy that provided coverage for communicable diseases. And because that policyholder had that coverage, that aspect of their claim actually survived the motion. The rest of the case was dismissed, but the court allowed it to proceed on the claim for coverage under the communicable diseases um, endorsement. But for the most part, so far at least, uh, the insurers are uh, winning the battle in Michigan. Many of these cases are going up uh, on, to the Court of Appeals. Uh, and um, at least uh, the Gabrielides case out of Ingham County is attracting quite a bit of um, national attention. So we'll see what happens at the Court of Appeals um, for that case. So, so where are we going? Well, like I said, I think that this is going to be a long running battle. Uh, I think it's gonna go on for a long time. Uh, and I don't think there's gonna be resolution of these issues anytime soon. I also think that at the end of the day, there is not going to be uniformity um, across the, the country in terms of how these policies are interpreted. It's important to remember that insurance policies are contracts and contracts are governed by state law. There's no overarching federal law. Even when a case is in federal court, um, the federal judge is going to apply state law to the insurance policy in terms of interpreting the, the policy. And so what that means is we actually have 50 different state Supreme Courts or 50 different sets of, of laws that will apply to these policies. And there does not have to be uniformity uh, in terms of resolution. And I don't think there will be at the end of the day. Um, I think the policyholders will prevail in some states. We've seen that so far. There's been favorable decisions in Ohio and North Carolina and Washington and some other states. I think the insurers will prevail probably in the majority of states. And at the end of the day, I think we're gonna have a situation where um, uh, in some states, the policyholders prevail and get coverage. Uh, and in other states, the insurers um, prevail and do not have to provide, provide coverage. So what should a uh, business owner do at this point? Well, you know, our, our recommendation is you should always make your claim uh, because if you don't make a claim, you will not get coverage, period, end of story. Uh, if you do make a claim, uh, it'll get denied at this point, but uh, at least you preserved your rights. You can see what's going to happen uh, at the appellate level with some of these cases. So that's the, the summary of where things are in terms of um, the the business interruption litigation. Eric? Thank you very much, Andy. That was really helpful and interesting to me. It's been a while since we've connected about the where, kind of where things are in Michigan or elsewhere on this. So um, it's, it's uh, fascinating how this plays out differently across different states. And uh, I know we'll keep folks updated as those, uh, those appeals are heard and if the law is changing, uh, we'll, we'll put out updates. So we really appreciate you taking the time to, to update this group um, on this important topic. And if people have questions, um, you, can, you can put those in the, um, in the chat box in the Q&A area and we'll circle back to those at the end of the presentation. Um, so thanks again, Andy. Um, so now we'll, I'll, I'll have a quick update here, just on small business administration funding issues. I don't think this will take terribly long, uh, but there are a couple of recent developments. Uh, the last time we did a Monday morning roundup, I think was two weeks ago. We, we skipped this most recent week because many people were away or on, on vacation. Um, I believe as of two weeks ago, we had the news that the PPP loan application deadline, so for the Paycheck Protection Program, that the loan application deadline had been extended to May 31st. Um, however, it's become more clear, uh, it's become clearer since then that it's very unlikely that the current appropriations will last until May 31st for the PPP. You might remember from if you were if you were watching uh, our update or just in general tracking what was happening with the PPP that 
although Congress extended the application deadline from March 31st until May 31st, uh, Congress did not appropriate additional funding for the PPP at that time. And so now we're in a bit of a, an interesting situation where it's very likely that the current appropriations will um, run out probably before the end of April. I think there's roughly $60 billion left in PPP appropriations. And based on what the SBA is saying, as well as kind of independent projections, it looks like um, that'll probably run out in the coming weeks or sooner. And uh, there's a couple estimates out there that I saw that there might need to be an additional 100 to 150 billion needed to fund the PPP, you know, if it were to continue operating normally, quote unquote, through May 31st. So in the absence of any limitation on appropriations, if it just ran all the way through May 31st, um, they, they would expect potentially an additional 100 or 150 billion thereabouts in um, requests for for loans. Uh, so, you know, there's some discussion about whether Congress has the appetite to appropriate more funding for the PPP to allow um, loans to be kind of funded normally, quote unquote, through the end of May, or whether um, some groups have started to to argue whether we, you know Congress should just let the the PPP sort of wind down and um, not not provide any additional funding and kind of let let small businesses move on from this um, this situation where they're you know in some part relying on PPP funds. There's there's some folks who are concerned, uh, many folks who are concerned that you know especially as uh, the economy is reopening and smaller businesses start to have a little bit firmer footing that uh, the PPP loans may uh, kind of maybe creating an unequal playing field or, or uh, a level playing field for for businesses. So we'll see what happens uh, with that and whether there's any additional funding provided. One sub point that Congress is looking at kind of a narrower issue beyond just the, the whole issue of PPP appropriations uh, for all borrowers is whether there might be some more limited additional appropriation for sole proprietors and um, uh, Schedule C uh, filers who, who had, um, they now have the ability to apply for an increased PPP loan amount compared to the original uh, legislation. So um, there's some thought that Congress might make make it so that sole proprietors and similar um, businesses might be able to retroactively sort of true up their original loan so that they can benefit from the, um, the change in the law there. Some businesses, um, you know, the amount of their, their original PPP loan would have been greater by several times if, if they had been able to benefit from the way the, the law currently works, but um, at least the way the rules and regulations and the law are presently written, they, they're not allowed to kind of retroactively seek an increase to their original loan. Um, so that, that might be one thing that gets changed, even if there's not a broader um, appropriation of significant additional funds to the PPP. And then um, sort of changing gears on the PPP to the forgiveness, uh, the loan forgiveness topic. I know I've, I've talked to many clients about this, um, a source of frustration um, and understandably so. The SBA has had many loans under review, quote unquote, for much longer than the 90 day period that it originally set for itself through its own rulemaking uh, last year. So, you know, many borrowers, especially those with loans above $2 million, where they're assured of some level of SBA scrutiny or review, um, the, the SBA is well past that 90 day deadline, and the borrower doesn't really know what the status is, when to expect a decision. 
so we we kind of went through the end of the calendar year uh some many of our borrower clients had put in their loan forgiveness applications before the end of September, hoping that they would then get a decision before the end of 2020. Uh, others, you know, at least were hoping that they would have decisions by around now as they're kind of finalizing audited financial statements and, and things like that. But um, man, many of those borrowers still have not heard anything. And so we're in a, we're still in a bit of limbo on that front. And if you haven't reached out to us about that already, I'd be curious to hear from those of you who are clients and are in that situation. I know there are probably quite a few. Um, as we may uh, we may organize some communication um, because I know it's difficult for individual clients to call out them, you know, their own circumstances, own circumstances, and you know, kind of raise their hand individually and say, "Hey, what's going on?" But if we can find a way to do that collectively, um, that, that's something that you know we're we're looking at um, potentially organizing if we don't start to see loans clear this SBA review process sooner than later. Um, so I'd be interested to hear from you. Okay, um, changing gears a little bit on the shuttered venue operator grant program. Uh, this is the SBA grant program for uh, performing arts venues, um, museums, zoos, uh, concert venues, movie theaters. Uh, the, the SBA took uh, quite a while to set up this program. They said from the ground up, and that's probably true because it's a very unique program from the SBA's perspective. They traditionally have not been in the in the business of administering grant programs, if you will, they usually work with lenders to uh, guarantee loans that, the, that lenders have made. So this SVOG grant program has been um, a significant undertaking for SBA. And unfortunately, when they they finally got to launch the uh, got around to launching the application portal last Thursday, the portal crashed almost immediately. Um, so it has not reopened yet. The SBA did not accept or fund any SVOG applications before it. The, the portal crashed, and they said that they will communicate a new launch date uh, in advance to put applicants on equal footing and to give them plenty of time to prepare. Um, meanwhile, SBA has been updating guidance continually right up and really until the, the date of the uh, planned portal launch, uh, changing guidance, uh, fixing inconsistencies between some of the rules and FAQs, uh, issues on the application form itself that didn't really align with how the law was written. So it's been um, a bumpy rollout, so, you know, not, not unlike the PPP itself, although here the SBA took quite a lot longer, several months to to roll out the program and build out the process. Whereas with the PPP, it was literally three or four days between the date that the CARES Act was finalized last year and when uh, lenders started receiving applications. So it's been another bumpy one, but hopefully uh, they'll fix some of these technical glitches and reopen the portal uh, soon. We'll keep folks posted about that. And then if you're an applicant or would be applicant, uh, I just highly recommend keeping track of those FAQs as they are being updated now pretty regularly after after a period of time where they weren't updated that frequently. And there's some important, potentially some important changes in there for SVOG um, applicants. And then lastly, I'll just touch briefly on the Restaurant Revitalization Fund grants. Um, obviously, this is the SBA grant program for the restaurant industry and similar businesses. It's a very similar scheme to the SVOG program and as much as it's a direct grant for an SBA and not uh, funding you secure through a lender that's guaranteed by SBA, there's been no official, unless something came out early this morning, you know, maybe during this um, webinar, there's been nothing official from SBA yet regarding the 
Restaurant Revitalization Fund grant program, and I imagine that they're going to want to get the SBOG issues straightened out before they officially launch anything with the restaurant grants. But um, there is, there's been industry reporting that the SBA is planning to launch this program in April, and the, um, the National Restaurant Association has interestingly issued its own FAQs which are based on discussions that it has had with SBA staff in helping to provide feedback on the program design. Um, I would just caution that that guidance is not official, obviously. You can find that pretty easily on the National Restaurant Association website. Um, and we, you know, just like we talked about a moment ago with the PPP and the SFOG, the SBA may well change its position on issues right up until the time the program is launched, and in some cases, after the program is launched. So um, it's probably a good thing to track if you're in the restaurant industry or, you know, you work with clients in the restaurant industry. Um, I definitely recommend following the progress of that and reading the reporting, but right now, nothing official to go by from SBA. Uh, and then lastly, I don't know that this will be a huge issue, at least for our clients, but it's, it's not entirely clear, I guess, whether not-for-profit restaurants will be eligible for this program. Not-for-profits are eligible for both the PPP and the SFOG. So in the, um, in the National Restaurant Association FAQs, it said that this issue was still un undecided, which was interesting to me, and I just wanted to note that. But um, other than that, uh, we're, we're waiting to hear from SBA on this program and we'll obviously keep folks posted. So that is, that is the update on, um, on the SBA funding topics. And again, if you want to drop in any questions, we can circle back to those at the end of the presentation. And uh, for now, I will turn it over to Sandy, uh, who I think is with us. And Sandy will give us a bit of an update on the MIOSHA order expiration. Well, good morning, everybody. Thanks, Eric. Yes, last week when we were putting together what our agenda would be this morning, I said, well, we're definitely going to need to talk about whatever the new MIOSHA order is, um, because the current emergency order expires on April 14th, and surely by Monday, April 12th, um, we will have something for us to be talking and thinking about. Um, mm -hmm. We are 13 months, 14 months into this pandemic, and I'm starting to worry about myself, right? That they always say, um, right? Uh, expected uh, doing the same behavior and expecting a different result is the first sign of insanity. And I think that might be where I'm headed, guys, um, because there is nothing to report um, this morning other than we still don't have an updated rule. Um, so this is that's what my week looked like last week, waiting, waiting, waiting in a waiting game. Um, I was going to try really hard to Photoshop my picture and Andy's picture and Eric's picture and Amy and Luke's picture on that um, Friday picture because um, I thought that would be funny because I had all this time on my hands because the Wyosha wasn't <laughs> issuing a new rule, but I thought that was a little overkill. Um, so I didn't do that. But uh, so so no news. I don't know if no news is good news, um, but there's nothing to share on that on the Michigan front. Um, but some things did happen um, in the in the labor and employment world as it relates to the COVID-19 pandemic last week. So I want to share those with you. So we're still waiting of course, on the MIOSHA rule, and we'll continue to be watching and, and waiting for that. And so it's important for all of our employment um, clients who are listening um, to remember then that the existing um, emergency MIOSHA rule is, is still the rule, Re regardless of whether your entire population has, has, you know, is fully vaccinated, any of those pieces, right? Um, the existing MIOSHA rule doesn't account for any changes in mitigation strategy because of vaccination status. Um, so it's important for us to remember and to be continuing um, to, to monitor our own workplaces to make sure that those mitigation strategies keep up. 
On the federal OSHA side, you remember, you may remember several weeks ago, we were talking about um, that we were starting to see some movement on the federal OSHA side related to an emergency standard related to COVID. And so this last week we heard um, that federal OSHA lives within the Department of Labor, uh, that the Department of Labor chief was actually pulling back on um, the, the draft um, or the conversations that were happening related to a federal um, emergency standard related to COVID. And um, he was pulling that back um, for further review. Interestingly though, very late in the day on Friday, um, we uh, received word that uh, President Biden um, has selected an individual or is putting forth an individual um, for um, for the uh, federal OSHA lead position, right? The department director position. And he is going to be nominating an individual named Doug Parker. Um, and that is interesting because Doug Parker is currently um, the head of California OSHA. And that's interesting because Cal OSHA um, also currently has an emergency COVID-19 standard, um, just like we do here in Michigan. Um, so it's interesting to see how all of those pieces uh, may go together, may not. Obviously, this is just the nomination stage still has to be uh, confirmed, all of those pieces. Um, but a couple pieces happening there at the federal level that were interesting um, to people like me anyway last week <laughs> while, I, while I was waiting on uh, Michigan OSHA to say something. Um, on the MDHHS front, also a very exciting week last week. We know that April 5th here in Michigan, um, that is when uh, vaccine availability um, or I should say eligibility opened up to all individuals 16 and over um, related to whichever vaccine uh, you may be eligible for. Certainly eligibility doesn't necessarily mean appointment availability, um, but based on uh, the numbers that we saw last week um, and Governor Whitmer making a push for additional vaccines to make their way to Michigan, um, related to, to our COVID uh, kind of surge numbers right now, um, that's that's all good news on the vaccination front. And so it's important if, if you've got a bookmark, for example, um, on the MDHHS vaccination page, they did update their vaccine prioritization guidance last Monday, just to reflect now that all adults 16 and over um, ha are eligible to receive the vaccine here in Michigan. Um, additional um, updates are some information related to travel safety during the COVID-19 pandemic that probably coordinated uh, with a lot of spring breaks uh, for public school. Nothing particularly controversial there, except for the item that also lives in this next document we're going to talk about, which is MDHHS's uh, COVID-19 public health FAQs. Um, one thing that uh, kind of quietly uh, came out last week was an update to this document um, that reinstitutes, essentially, if you can go to the next slide, please, reinstitutes um, the 14 day quarantine period. So let's walk through this a little bit. If you are a Michigan employer, we're gonna um, give you the keys here and exactly how to manage this in your workforce. So MDHHS announced um, that individuals who've been exposed to someone with COVID-19 must quarantine for 14 days. You may remember a couple of months ago, they put out a press release that said that they were um, going to adopt generally the updated CDC guidance that allowed for a 10 day quarantine period provided that the close contact remained asymptomatic, so on and so forth. So they have pulled that back and now MDHHS is saying we're reinstituting that 14 day period. And so we've gotten a lot of questions from our clients saying, whoa, 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 which, which one do we follow here? CDC, MDHHS, it's not in an order. How do we think about that? So if we remember, if you actually look on the CDC page that talks about close contact quarantine, that page says 14 days, but uh, local health departments may allow um, the, a 10 day close contact quarantine period or may even allow a seven day close contact contact period if an individual is tested at day five or after and that test is negative. Now MDHHS never signed on to the to the testing um, to the to the seven day quarantine period with testing at day five. They did sign on to the 10 day, but now they're pulling that back, right? And so the CDC even tells us that it's the local public health authorities that have those final decisions about how long quarantine periods should last, of course, based on what the local conditions are. 
So what does this practically mean? Let's go ahead and go to the next slide. So if you are a Michigan employer, have employees in Michigan, you know that you are subject to Michigan's COVID-19 Employment Rights Act or what was called PA Public Act 238. And there is, is the requirement for how long you must keep an individual out of your workplace. And there it says individuals who've been in close contact with an individual who tests positive for COVID shall not report to um, to work until either one of two conditions is met. One, CDC's recommended quarantine has passed or the employer is advised, is advised by a healthcare provider or a public health professional that they have completed their period of quarantine. Previously, uh, right, we knew generally, we thought that the local public health departments would be advising that 10 day. Um, and so would actually under the COVID ERA, most folks were getting back to work under the 10 day under prong two there. But now we know, right, MDHHS is signaling to us that they, they are pulling back on the 10 day, they're reinstituting the 14 day. And so it's unlikely we'll see locals um, continue with the 10-day quarantine um, and you'll likely see um, those locals reinstitute that 14-day quarantine. So as you're um, thinking about that, when you have a, a positive case or you have someone doing their daily entry screen and they are reporting that they've been in close contact, we need to recognize that we need to redo the math there and we're no longer generally talking about 10 days, we're talking about 14. Certainly, if you have an employee who has specifically been released by their local public health department under a different time frame, um, and they're able to you know, provide that information to you, you're certainly able to take that. But um, generally, I think we're about to see the 14, the 14 day period um, go, go through there. Um, a question that we had prior to the webinar was asking specifically about healthcare employees and are those individuals still exempt um, from close contact quarantine? Remember, um, for Michigan employers, right, we follow what the COVID-19 Employment Rights Act says, and there's very specific exemptions um, in, in that act, and those exemptions have not changed. And so, um, as an example, right, healthcare providers, again, provided that that individual is asymptomatic and is critical to um, is critical to operations. All of those pieces, there's a number of exemptions, about nine, nine different classifications of employees who may be exempted from close contact quarantine um, if certain conditions are met and those are unchanged. Um, speaking of vaccinations, another question that we received prior to the quarantine, um, we had a couple of clients asking, am I allowed to ask my employees their vaccination status? Am I allowed to ask them to provide me proof of their vaccination status? And the EEOC has, has been clear on this as it's related to COVID-19. And the EEOC has said that asking an employee or requiring an employee to show you proof um, of receipt of the COVID-19 vaccine is not a disability related inquiry, but we need to be careful here um, because if you're saying, hey, Sandy, have you gotten your vaccine? Um, yes or no? Okay, if it's yes, show me your card. I wanna take a copy, put it in your confidential medical file. That's all fine. But if I say no, um, you right, as the employer, the next question could get you in trouble if your next question is why, <laughs> right? Because my answer to that um, could reveal information related to um, a, a disability, or it's certainly a medical um, medical inquiry that we then fall back on what I call, I'm using air quotes here, our normal uh, uh, non-COVID, right, non-COVID world, normal ADA rules, which says any of those medical inquiries must be consistent with business necessity. So unless we have a good reason to be asking the why, um, we shouldn't be doing that. But it's certainly okay, the EEOC says, to ask, um, have you gotten vaccinated and if you have we're requiring you to provide us proof of your vaccination status that's perfectly fine um, one last thing that happened last week that i do just want to make sure uh, folks on the call are aware of um, because it might be in, impacting your employees um, early in the day on friday governor whitmer held <clears throat> A COVID-19 update um, press conference. And one of the pieces um, that she talked about there was specifically related to Michigan's surge. Um, and so she was asking for a voluntary um, 
pause uh, for certain activities, a pause for youth sports for a period of time, um, a pause for indoor um, dining for a period of time, a voluntary pause for high schools going virtual. Um, now, uh, different uh, areas of the state are doing different things, um, but to the extent that you have employees in either of these areas um, that may be participating in those voluntary pauses that aren't voluntary on the employee side, but the organization, um, right? If, if I've got a if I've got a kiddo whose school district has decided to go virtual, um, and that's and that's kind of thrown me for a loop, and now I need to work remotely or I don't have childcare, we need to remember um, that that's a COVID nineteen related closure, and to the extent that you are an employee employer who is voluntarily participating with what I'll call the FFCRA like leave benefits that are now really a tax benefit that would be a qualifying reason. So I just wanted to flag that for everybody, um, for those who may have been um, out and about in other places last week and perhaps missed that and are coming back to a Monday morning going, what happened while I was gone? Those, those are the big updates on the employment side. Hey, Sandy, this is Eric. Um, thank you for that. One question that came in through the chat, and I think this is just very confirmatory, but just um, at, for the sake of clarity, the question is, if an employer is doing a return to work survey for those who are remote, working remotely, and if the employer asks if people would like to share whether or not they are vaccinated and then require proof for those who are, but they do not follow up for those who are not vaccinated. Um, that's okay. Yes. Yep. That's totally fine. Asking vaccination status, the EEOC has said, is fine. Okay. Thank you. I see a couple um, questions have come in, and I'll just quickly answer those. One of them was, um, I thought the Myosha rule did make some allowances for vaccinated employees since it follows the CDC, so vaccinated employees don't have to quarantine if exposed, but not symptomatic. So um, remember that it's the COVID-19 Employment Rights Act, PA 238, that is kind of our isolation and quarantine rules. If I'm an employee who's tested positive or who is showing symptoms or am a close contact, I follow the COVID-19 Employment Rights Act, um, which generally the MIOSHA rule adopts, right? And so in the COVID-19 ERA, it does say, um, yes, in the COVID-19, it does say it generally follows the CDC guidelines. And right here, word when we're talking about CDC guidelines of uh, fully vaccinated individuals who have been identified as a close contact, um, but are asymptomatic, do not have to quarantine if they're within 90 days of their vaccine. Um, so in that sense, yes, there is a carve out for fully vaccinated um, individuals. I want to be clear that when I'm talking about the MIOSHA rule, we're talking about face mask requirements or we're even talking about the remote work rule. Um, generally, right, folks should be working remotely unless it's infeasible for them to do so generally. Just because I'm fully vaccinated um, doesn't implicate um, whether I'm able to, to perform, perform my work on site or at home. That isn't um, a consideration that exists in the MIOSHA rule right now. It's still just based on feasibility of work. Um, and whether I'm fully vaccinated or not fully vaccinated doesn't go into that um, doesn't go into that equation. So wanted to differentiate that. Um, next question, is there still a quarantine period for travel outside of state? There's not a Michigan rule, right, under the MIOSHA rule. There isn't a requirement that says, hey, employers, you have to, you know, if people have traveled outside of the state, you have to keep them out of your workplace for a certain period of time. The MIOSHA rule says, um, that you have to do a daily entry screening that generally asks about um, if, if the employee is, uh, is experiencing symptoms and if they've had close contact. So that's not a state requirement um, that you're required to uh, exclude folks from the workplace who have traveled outside of the state. However, um, like I always say, it's important wherever you are sitting um, that you uh, become really familiar with the local public health requirements um, in your in your county or through your own local public health department, because at least in the very beginning of the pandemic, some of those locals did have specific rules that were more strict and stringent um, than 
uh, than the state rule. And certainly, as we know, there are other states who have um, certain requirements about folks entering the state. Michigan does not have that right now. Um, and so that's not a Michigan rule, but that doesn't mean that's not a rule that might not impact folks in your workplace. And that's all I see. Yeah. Terrific. Thank you very much, Sandy. And I don't see any other questions in the Q&A or in the chat room feature. So with that, we will uh, wrap up this week's Monday morning uh, roundup. And again, we so appreciate uh, all of you taking the time to join us for our, our Monday meetings and other events. Uh, we really uh, were better attorneys because of all the great questions that you all come up with and engagement with you. So uh, wherever you are, um, we hope you'll join us again next Monday and for events in between and uh, stay in touch with us, stay healthy, and uh, uh, stay safe. Thank you. Have a good day. Thank you all. Bye-bye, everybody.